again, good morning, Chevy Chase Church, and greetings from Westminster Church, D.C., where I'm an associate, a parish associate, and also from the spiritual community at Howard University School of Divinity. Greetings from both of these communities. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer always. Amen. So as we reflect on this Pentecost Sunday, one of the things that comes to my mind is the sad fact that for most of us Americans, few of us have had the opportunity to really learn to speak a foreign language well. In most countries where we might travel either for work or for pleasure, we can get along pretty well in English because English is the, the lingua franca of the world. In most places we go, there are plenty of people who can speak English and we don't have to learn another language. And that's really a great misfortune because languages are not just systems of communication, they embody whole ways of being and understanding the world. Both my daughters learned to speak a foreign language when they were in DC public schools and then had the opportunity to spend significant time in countries where those language, languages are spoken in college, so they became fairly fluent. And one of my granddaughters is in a language immersion program and speaks French and now some Spanish really amazingly fluently. One of my students at Howard was born to Ethiopian parents in Paris, but also speaks English so well that you would never know that it wasn't her first language, tells me that she speaks German even better. I'm always amazed in awe of, of people who have that sort of ability. Just this morning, as I was Ubering over, because my car is in the shop, my, my Uber driver was chatting away with her mother in whatever her na native language was. She's from Nigeria. I wasn't quite sure what the language was. But at any rate, then she quickly turned and spoke to me in English. And that's a common experience I expect many of us have had in cabs or Ubers or Lyfts or, or whatever. But if you're like me, I can only stand in, in awe at people who have that ability. The Old Testament lesson from Genesis 11 today tells the story of how the people in Babylon wanted to build the greatest tower of their day to impress everyone with their great building skills. They were the greatest empire at that time and the, the lowly Hebrews mocked them. They called the tower Babel, which both in Hebrew and in English, sounds like Babel. In Hebrew, Bab is the word for gate and El is the word for God. 
but it also in both Hebrew and English sounds like Babel. So they were calling, they were mocking and ridiculing this tower as calling it the Tower of Babel. Because according to this ideological story, God was not pleased with what the Babylonians were doing, building this tall tower that was called by the Babylonians a ziggurat. And so God decided to do something that would slow them down significantly, which was to confuse their languages. Instead of having just one common language that they could all understand and communicate in, God changed things up and made them speak many different languages, which would make it much more difficult to build this tower. Now, I don't think God was against building projects per se, or this, uh, this tower in particular. But I think the point was that God was against the motivation behind this tower and the tendency of empires like the Babylonian Empire to oppress the smaller kingdoms around it. And that's what the problem was that needed to be changed by changing up the languages. And of course, we're well aware of our modern tendency to want to build tall towers, our skyscrapers, in which we have a similar kind of competition. The current tallest skyscraper is in Dubai. It's called the Burj Khalif, and it's 828 meters tall, which is to say 2,717 feet, which is about a half a mile tall. Now, to, to draw some comparison, the original World Trade Center tower in New York City was a little under 1,800 feet, which is to say about a third of a mile tall. So the tallest tower currently is a half a mile, that much taller than the World Trade Center one at, at a third of a mile was. Most of the tallest towers today are in China and most, in general, are somewhere in, in Asia. But the biggest concentration is actually in China. So the ancient Babylonians weren't the only ones that were obsessed with size. So the etiological story that we find in Genesis 11 is about the Babylonians' hegemonic desire to dominate. And with that domination, to be able to oppress the smaller kingdoms, the people around them, including the Hebrews, who, who, who mocked them with their story of the Tower of Babel. Later on, after this story, we get the story of God's covenant with Abraham, in which he says that Abraham's offspring would be a blessing to the world in contrast to what the Babylonians did to the rest of the world. And so we find in this story of Pentecost a reversal of the Tower of Babel. Everyone could hear the gospel story in their own language. What, what was going on? What, what happened? Well, there's, there's a theory, at least, that when everybody came together in Jerusalem for this Pentecost ceremony, originally this was called Shavuot in Hebrew, which means seven weeks. It was weeks, but it was actually seven weeks, and it was originally an agricultural ceremony, but by this time it had come to be a festival in celebration of the giving of the law at Sinai. So everybody came from far and wide to celebrate this, and they would have come with their own native languages, 
as well as the lingua franca of that time, which in the western part of the empire would have been Greek. In the eastern part, no, I've got it backwards. In the western part, it was Roman. In the eastern part, it would have been Greek. But they would have come with their own native languages as well as the language of the empire. So one theory is that people came speaking their own native languages and not, not the language of empire, Greek. And therefore, people were able to hear the gospel proclaimed in their own native languages, a language that would have spoken to their heart in a much more powerful way than hearing it spoken in, in Greek, as you might have expected. If you think about it, in that time, even moving back a little bit to, to Jesus' time, you know, we know Jesus spoke Aramaic. That would have, would have been his main language. But since he was a, a skilled worker, probably working in nearby Sephorus, the Roman capital of Galilee, there the language would have been Latin. But since the Greeks had Hellenized that area before, he also probably would have spoken a little Greek. So many people, even people who were not that well educated, probably spoke at least some of several different languages. And so it's not unlikely that many people coming to Jerusalem were able to speak not only their own language, but, a, but, a, but the, the Greek of the, the empire and so you can imagine people coming with many different languages and speaking their own language so that those others who were there who knew those languages could, could hear the gospel spoken in their own native tongue. So by doing that, by speaking, if they were speaking in their own language, there's a sense in which that would have decentered the the Greek of empire and brought those native languages to the center. It would have been a way of resisting the Greek of the empire and bringing their own native language to the center, even at the same time that it was unifying all these people from all these different cultures in their Christian community. Language is very political, even as it's very personal. When I left North Carolina to go north to college, the first day I walked on campus, I became acutely aware in a way that I'd never been aware before of my native accent. I came from a part of North Carolina where the accent was particularly twangy. And it only took a few hours on campus to hear the difference. And although I still don't have a very good ear, either for other spoken languages or for accents, I could tell in a moment that when I said hi to people, <laughs> that was very different than the hi that was the standard in, in New England. So I changed that just in a flash. The other thing that I changed didn't happen until my second year when my roommate worked on me. And every time I said, turn the light on, she said, on. It took the whole semester to change on to on. But that, that vowel changed to the point that even now, every once in a while, I get confused. And when I'm pronouncing O-W-N, it comes out of my head as on. And I have to, I have to re, I have to fix it. Those are the only things that I changed, but those two changes completely altered my accent to the point that few people today, although there are a few, who can discern my Alamance County, North Carolina accent. But that was very, that change was very political. And what if, 
instead of me having to change my accent, or I felt that I did, everybody had been able to change to accommodate me. My husband, when he first came down to North Carolina to meet my parents, did something that I, at the time I didn't know that he could do. Within minutes of meeting my parents, he started speaking in their accent. Completely blew me away. I, I couldn't even do that accent anymore. I had so conditioned myself away from it. But there he was, speaking Alamance County, North Carolina. Well, it turns out that he, does, he doesn't try to do this. It's just something that he starts moving toward any accent that he hears. It just, he's just really good with that sort of thing. And I was sitting there completely flabbergasted because I didn't know this about him. But I digress. Back to the main point, we have a diversity of accents, languages, and cultures. And we judge each other by these, these things. But if we could join them together and be unified in them rather than using them to distance ourselves from each other, how, would the, how different would the world be? Language is very powerful. So I think the lesson that I'm pushing for is that we are divided by language and culture. But we need to work against those distinctions not only, the, again, the formal distinctions of language, but the more subtle ones that come with culture. One more story, because again, it's not just about language, it's about culture. Years ago, a friend of my husband's named John was dying. And he called all of his friends to let them know. And my husband, Jeff, ended up spending a series of Saturdays with him because John was wanting to review his Russian Orthodox theology. And Jeff is a voracious reader. And so each Saturday, he would go spend with John. And after that day's conversation, he would go home and order a whole bunch of books from Amazon, spend the week reading those books as fast as he could to get ready for the following Saturday's session. So one day during this, this period, John was at a party for his children, and he was being, you know, since he was dying, he was a little tired, so he sort of wandered to the back of the house. And there he met a young man who turned out was the son of the owners of the house. And he struck up a bit of a conversation with him. And then as he was leaving, he mentioned this to the parents. Parents were amazed. This young man had not said a word for months. He was deeply troubled. So later when the young man reached out to John, and John knew then that he was a fragile young man, John shared some of his own story with him, but he had learned that, that he was Jewish, so he was careful to reach out to him in his own cultural theological terms, and he shared with him some books that he thought expressed the essence of Judaism. Um, books by Buber and, and other well-known Jewish authors. 
John, John had flames of fire on his head. There was something about him that communicated and comforted. They were thinking about putting him in a hospice. And so they went and visited the hospice, ultimately decided he would stay at home. But some of the people in the hospice were so moved by John that they started reaching out to John rather than their priest or rabbi or minister because there was something about John. He had this, these flames of fire about him that, that really touched people. So what, what can we do to make Pentecost happen every day? Some of our children or grandchildren may have the opportunity to learn foreign languages in, in school. Let's encourage them to do that and maybe learn along with them. Maybe we can learn more about the, the culture of Islam so that we are open to Muslims here in DC. Let us be welcoming to refugees, even though it sometimes seems like DC is getting a disproportionate number and it's a burden for our city, but here they are. We have to, we have to meet them. One of my dearest colleagues at Howard, Kane Hope Felder, who's a New Testament professor. He carried with them a, a roll of $1 bills. And whenever he met somebody in the street, not only did he give them some if they needed it, but he engaged them, made sure that he saw them. And since I was maybe could be thought of as a little bit homeless when I was first at Howard, he reached out to me in a way that made me feel at home at Howard. So let us, let us try to make every day a day of Pentecost. Let us reach out to those who speak other languages and come from different cultures. And whatever words we say, let us say those words with kindness, because kindness is a language that everybody understands. Let us make sure we communicate comfort so that, that we will have flames of fire on our head. To God be the glory. Amen.